Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today, we're going to be doing an August Q&A. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done something like this. And today, we've got a bit of a mixed bag of different questions that are all over the place. So uh, let's just hop right into it with the first question. Um, what is a niche rule or gameplay element that you'd like to try out in a game? And I think I'll start off and give Pat some time to, to consider what his answer to this question might be. Uh, this is a question that came up on the Discord, and one of the things that we had tried many years ago that very niche and very unique, uh, but not altogether unknown to people who might have done any sort of LARPing, is the idea that wherever you get hit, like if you get hit in a, an extremity, like an arm or a leg, you lose the use of that arm or leg. So. Basically, it gives you a little bit of extra, like a few extra hit points, so to speak. If you get hit in the chest, then you're out. If you get hit in the head, you're out. If you get hit in either of the arms, you lose the use of that arm or either of the legs, you use that use of that leg. So basically, if you uh, are right-handed and you get shot in the right arm, well, then now you have to only use your left arm and you can't use your right arm for support or anything. It's basically like you didn't have it. And similarly with your legs, like you would hop along. But if you lose both arms or you lose both legs, obviously you're, you know, that's it. You're out for the game. And if you get hit as, in the chest or head, as I said, um, then you're out as well. Bonus points for shouting, oh God, my arm. <laughs> yeah, well, and the, we tried doing that a few times um, back when our airsoft scene was much smaller, like around, you know, 2008, 2009, something like that, where we had eight or 10 people showing up maximum to a game. And it works really well if you have a lot of faith in your uh, community's ability to self-police, because it's supposed to be fun, but obviously it's very easy to to game that a little bit. Yeah, it requires people to be willing to play in the spirit of it. Yeah, totally. And it gets really silly. It gets really silly real quick because you have people who decide that, okay, well, I'm, I got hit in the leg, so I'm just going to take a knee and I'm just going to stand here or if I need, or well, not stand here clearly, but take a knee here and not move or move sort of very limited or with some help from a team member. But you have people who decide to keep playing and just literally just hop along all around the field, which at airsoft fields is probably not a great idea because your footing uh, is it's, not excellent. It's not necessarily the most sensible play, but like you do get that multi uh Black Knight moment out of it. And yeah, so that's true. It... Uh, I feel like this is a, a rule that initially seems like it's good for milsim stuff. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you actually play with it, you're like, oh, no, this is great for silly, silly games. But like, it's terrible for milsim. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> um, and, and like, which it, doesn't you mean know, I don't enjoy it. <laughs> well, yeah. And like, you know, we've talked about the legs, but like ch changing arms, like that's that's a problem because firing one handed, whether it's your strong side or your offside is Definitely not great. It's not an awesome experience. Uh, and then on top of that, you add on reloading and all this kind of stuff. Like you might switch to your pistol and that's fine, but then, you know, you're reloading. Like it's definitely you get to a point where like the your utility to your team is obviously like zero. Yeah. And you get to a point where you are combat ineffective. <laughs> well, yeah. And as a result of that, you just veer directly into the silly, right? From my point of view, anyway. And that's the, our, sort of our experience when we were doing that. It is really that it gets goofy really quickly rather than like, players actually trying to take it seriously. Um, in practice, it doesn't work that way. It was great when I ran the P90 because I could use that thing one-handed, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, can't reload it one-handed, but you can only sort of reload it with both hands, so whatever. <laughs> and it's definitely the kind of thing to where, and I mean, you, Pat, you said it, like, you know, you try and do it in practice and you're like, uh, this is kind of whatever. But like, one of the things that does happen with those kinds of game modes that are so niche, even if you run it well, and even if, you know, everything goes goes perfectly, et cetera, which it likely won't, but let's assume that it does for a second, you get tired of it pretty quick. Like, it loses its luster in relatively short order, right? Once you've done that for like half an hour, you're like, okay, that's enough of that. Can we please go back to just something normal? Yeah, it's not a game mode that like, I feel uh, had a protracted lifespan in our community. <laughs> no, definitely um, not. You know, definitely like worth a giggle with your friends, uh, but 
not a, a game mode to keep playing over and over, or at least for us. <laughs> um, your mileage may vary. Uh, for me, you know, in terms of sort of like um, relatively complex or like rare rules to see played in Airsoft. Uh, so I, um, I would love to try playing uh, and I mentioned this before, but like playing a game where vehicles are in play, I think it would be super, super cool. Uh, for our local community's size, it's pretty impractical. I don't think it's going to, mm -hmm. you know, going to be a thing here unless I win the lottery, <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. Um, but I think it would be rad. Uh, you know, the other one, and this is something we've done, uh, is the use of uh, medics in play, but complicating it by making it not just you know like wrap a piece of cloth around the arm of the guy and then he's good to get back in uh i think yeah. my favorite version of that that we've done although it's definitely the hardest on the medics because of the added weight uh is uh, drink a bottle of water yeah um and it's really easy to implement for uh a day because you just go to costco and buy a couple of pallets of like cheap bottled water so mm -hmm. there's no huge issue there um and it adds a lot more verisimilitude to people being medic back in because it takes time, right? They're just not getting back up every six seconds. Yeah. Um, and that takes some of the, I'll say, unfun aspects out of having medics in play for me. Like the, oh, you know, like I shot that guy, but my team's not going to make any progress because there's a medic right next to him sort of stuff goes away. Um, yeah, absolutely. And for clarity, like what we've done is like the medic, the medic has to administer the water, which is to say they have to give the water to the person and the person has to drink it, but they have to wait with the other person. So yeah, while that's out. happening, <laughs> yeah, like neither of them, unless the person is able to like literally chug the, you know, 300 whatever mils of water it is uh, and just like down it in like two seconds, both of those players are going to be occupied for a second. Um, the other thing I would suggest too, if you listen to this and you're like, wow, that's a great idea, make it so people have to return the empties to you because obviously you don't want to be littering on your field. Uh, so it's very easy to get them to be like, hey, when you drink it, the medic has to collect it back. And then when the medic goes to get supplies, they swap the water bottles for the empties, I should say, for fresh ones. Um, like Pat was saying, there's this piece around, well, the water weighs. So obviously the medic wants to carry as much water as they can, but they're not going to be carrying 20 bottles because that's going to be, you know, like, you know, 15 kilos or, or whatever. Uh, they don't want to be hauling that much water. Right. Yeah. It starts to impact the medic's ability to get around the field and thus be an effective medic. Uh, the other thing is like people are, I'm sure are listening and going like, well, yeah, but I can chug like a bottle of water in six seconds. Yeah. But the seventh or eighth time you try to do that <laughs> during a game, <laughs> yeah. you're like, Oh, I'm feeling sloshy. Yeah. Um, especially, especially if you, you're the kind of guy like, you know, who gets hit a lot in a short order. Um, yeah. Like that's not, yeah, you're going to be full of, full of water. Oh, I do not wish to be medic back in. I am very gurgly. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time you know it's also great because if you're playing like a protracted game and it's warm it also kind of forces everyone to stay hydrated so it totally and that was part of our like logic too when we put that 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 rule in place is, like, is the fact that you know for a lot of airsofters uh, hydration is really important but it's not something that you really think about too much and so yep. in this way you're like at the very least uh, some players who are in a position where they're going to get hit, which means that they're probably a little bit more active, are going to have an opportunity at least to be administered some water, right? Yep. And like we have definitely uh, experienced across uh, a fair amount of our play that like a lot of people don't necessarily bring hydration uh, or adequate hydration to games. Uh, when we've used the rule, we've used it in Milsim or Milsim adjacent stuff. So it's been all day games where like you'd have people show up with no water and it's like, well, you're going to be playing for 10 hours. So you're going to need to drink water. Let's force that into the equation of yeah. it. Um, but I actually do think it's a fun rule that you could implement in like a bunch of different game modes that adds a bit of, again, a bit more verisimilitude and a little bit of uh, complexity without it being too much of a pain in the ass. Yeah. One of the rules as well that I had been thinking about uh, for potentially doing another op at, at Redcliffe when such a thing was, was possible. Like, I'm not sure that it's ever going to be possible to really do an op at Redcliffe like we used to anymore. Yeah, I um, think that ship has sort of sailed and yeah. or sunk. 
Uh, but one of the things, what if you remember when you had done the like um, operation, I think it was as Guardian Chill when we had like uh, it was a- asymmetric warfare. Like you had a a group of a small group of highly skilled player against a larger force of just let's say regulars, right? Yep. Um, one of the ways that we had, you know, thought about making that more complicated is that as the smaller force was destroying objectives, that gave them particular bonuses and stuff like that. And one of the things that I had considered as an additional gameplay for it to do it uh, in the future, an additional ga- gameplay element, I should say, if we were to do it in the future, was that the defensive team could also implement countermeasures. Um, so, like, if you had, as an example, a radar tower uh, and the attackers could go and they could set off an EMP, quote unquote, at this radio tower that would force the other team to turn off their radios for a period of time, like an hour, which is a rule that we had, which was pretty cool. They We would turn off the radios, except for safety issues, but the radios for communications were not used for a period of an hour if it was destroyed. Which is but really, the other um, team... Which is really good if you're, if you're used to playing in a large AO with radios uh, and have never experienced what having your comms actually fail feels like and it, it's that is jarring <laughs> yeah so and it's something that you know the attackers would need to coordinate on and all this kind of stuff but basically all this to say that the defenders could also take steps to go and reinforce their tower to like i don't know shield some stuff from emp or whatever to make it so that if the emp bomb went off it would only be 20 minutes rather than an hour but all this to say, like all those gameplay elements would rely on the defenders going and completing certain tasks at that area. And so one of the things that we had said was you need to take the engineer on your team, whoever that is, and bring them to the area to build these defenses. But they're not going to build anything. Rather, they're going to go and they're going to solve like math puzzles, basically, for, you know, 15 minutes. And assuming you complete the, the complete the puzzles with the right answers, then you would have built it correctly and then the team would get the benefit, right? And in a lot of ways, like what we were doing, although I don't really think, um, I don't think escape rooms were a thing at the time (laughs) Mm -hmm. as a like thing people did, but a lot of what we were doing was sort of that uh, implementing like puzzles into gameplay. Um, And one of the things I liked about doing the one that Phil just mentioned um, and about uh, an event that I'll mention in a second, uh, is that it gives people a chance to use skills from real life that are, you know, sensible uh, to apply to the Airsoft game for advantage. And that feels good for people. So, like, if you have someone who, you know, uh, actually is good at math, right, you know, mathematician, engineer, whatever, on your team, then you put them in that role and they do that job quicker and more efficiently and yeah. they get to feel cool and badass about it, and your team gets mechanical advantage out of it. Win-win. Um, mm-hmm. The example I was going to use is, uh, you know, during a game where uh, we had Philippe speaking French uh, as a, um, you know, our front-facing guy who was doing all the talking, and one of the other teams that was trying to communicate with us was like, do we have anyone from French immersion? Do we have anyone? And one of the guys who was there was a kid doing, you know, high school French immersion is like, yeah, I speak enough French to get by. Let's go. Um, yeah. And it just, it creates a really feels good moment for everyone involved, I think. Um, and I mean, in a lot of ways, this is really pulling stuff out of, you know, RPG, LARP, you know, escape room, like whatever you can get um, to do that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we we've talked about you know, wiring up a prop bomb that actually had like wires you could cut. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at some point I will enslave our electrical engineers to help me do that. <laughs> but it's the kind of thing that, you know, yeah, it might seem like niche rules or niche gameplay elements and stuff. And some of them, like we mentioned that the one that I start, said it right at the start, like with the shooting in the arms and legs may not actually work out the way that you think they will when you actually play test them. Right. Uh, And that's okay. But I think if you're listening and you're like, oh, well, we want to try different things. The key element here is try. And when you try, you don't necessarily succeed. And so when you are going out and saying, okay, well, there's this new thing I want to give a give a shot to, whether it's uh, including a language thing, whether it's including a math thing or, you know, some sort of puzzle element or whatever. You have to be prepared for the fact that it may not actually work. And that's that has to be fine. Um, but you also have to give it a shot sort of in earnest and sort of look at, okay, 
if I want this to succeed, where are the places where I could see it working and other areas where I could see it working less? And one thing, one trap we often fall into when we're designing is that we're, you add a lot of complexity to what you're attempting to do without actually adding a whole lot of gameplay value. And you see this in a lot of board games and stuff like that too, where it, the game is increasingly complex and that complexity makes the game harder to play, but not necessarily more fun or more strategic or whatever, right? And that's definitely, you know, uh, a trap. So like weirdly, one of the things that's really important about trying to do stuff like this is being willing to discard ideas if they're unfun. Um, but you have to be able to do it without sort of engaging in self-recrimination, right? So if you try something and it sucks, don't keep trying it or, you know, finish out the game and then be like, okay, that didn't work. And maybe workshop the idea and tinker with it. But don't, you know beat it to death don't be like oh well that we we didn't like that we tried it so we're not going to change it and try it again is usually not the best plan you know mm -hmm. and so like the the last game uh that i attended um we had a game mode that was a sort of progressive assault and they added in delivering a air quotes bomb uh a briefcase to a specific part of the field at the end of it as the sort of closing objective for it and when the ref told us what we were doing. I was like, well, I don't think it's possible with the players I have, like the number of players on my team versus the number of opposing players to do that in the time he has allotted. But I haven't tried it. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go as hard as I can. We're going to play it out. And at the end of the day, I was right. It wasn't possible to do it within the time allotted. We needed at least another 10 minutes to have a crack at it. But uh, it was a fun game. You know, so we go, all right, well, that wasn't unfun. It was just not technically winnable. <laughs> let's try it again. Let's tinker with it. Let's adjust it. And I, and I would say, too, just thinking back to that game as well, like I don't necessarily know that adding in that briefcase really did a lot to change the value of the gameplay. It made it more complex. But ultimately, if you can reach that building without the briefcase, you can reach the building with the briefcase, right? Totally. So like... It didn't add a whole lot of complexity. I think whether or not the briefcase was in play, you still needed 10 extra minutes, right? Like, oh, absolutely. That's the bottom it, it, line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We needed, you know, the game was 20 minutes long. In order for us to have a chance at accomplishing the objectives, it needed to be 30 minutes long. Uh, and you're absolutely right that the brief, briefcase is a good example of, okay, so we added a thing that didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, it in terms of changing that up, it's you know, okay, so can we put something in the briefcase that we have to fiddle with at the location? Can we make this so that something has to be done, uh, you know, while air quotes under fire to make this more complicated? Then you start yeah. getting a actually meaningful addition and it becomes more or less fun. Um, you know, I like the idea of that kind of prop. <laughs> um, I just think that it needs to be um, more complex than an empty briefcase. Uh, in order for it to me add meaningful value. Yeah, for sure. And so I think ultimately, when it comes to this question, I think like there's a lot of different things that we'd like to try. There's a lot of things that we have tried. But ultimately, if you're if you're the if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, well, we want to try stuff in our area, I would certainly recommend that you do that. I mean, you know, as yeah. long as you think it's fun, like that's what that's why we play airsoft. Like, don't take it too seriously that you're not willing to try goofy stuff. And, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it doesn't, then, you know, you can look at that and say, well, we're never doing it again if it's an absolute failure. But most of the time, you'll be able to find some salvageable bits that end up uh, informing what you do in the future. So I just, you know, keep an open mind towards that. And if you haven't tried a whole lot of stuff, I mean, just think about, well, wh what do you find fun, right? What do you find fun in games? What do you, like the, you know, games that we've done a payload game, for example, many years ago, so, you know, payload from Team Fortress 2, like that kind of stuff. There's stuff that you can replicate that works and there's stuff that you can replicate that doesn't work. And a, it's, it's uh, definitely worth trying. A really good example, I think, of like process refinement in that sense is so like we have done a couple of variations on just a deck of playing cards with objectives on it with mm -hmm. the intent that you just sort of like deal a couple of playing cards out and that's the game mode. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the first time I did that up, I know I actually used all 52 cards and it was ridiculous because it's difficult to create 52 distinct meaningful gameplay elements for an airsoft game uh, being played in a relatively small location. <laughs> yeah, <for laughs> Right, sure. like it just doesn't work. Uh, and so the second time it was 20 cards and it worked a lot better because everything 
that could be dealt out of the quote unquote deck was meaningful. Um, yeah. You know, uh, a funny sort of related thing like the just, you know, this briefcase is a bomb, bring it wherever. Uh, that is a lot more meaningful if you're doing it as sort of a CQB game because you need to have both hands or one hand on the briefcase and one hand on some sort of gun, ideally. Uh, and as we were talking about earlier, it's hard to single hand your primary. So it's a great excuse to use a secondary if you have one uh, mm -hmm. or people who are carrying, you know, little lightweight primaries that you can one hand get, you know, a, a big boost out of it. But it makes for interesting change up gameplay in a way where in a big field game, it doesn't have the same effect or impact. Yeah. All right. Next question, I think, is a bit more directed at me, but I'm happy to to, to engage. Um, how should I edit my airsoft videos to make them more interesting and get more views? Oh, this one's really easy. You give them to Philippe and make him do all the work, and yeah. uh, that solves all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I think uh, there's two parts to this question. So, one is how you make them interesting, and two, how you make them get more views. Um, I'll answer the last part first. I mean, I'm not the right person to be asking that question. I mean, we have a very, very mildly successful Air, Airsoft YouTube channel that's as a result of just pure algorithmic luck. Uh, people getting pushed our content in the early days and subscribing, and then here you are. Uh, and now you, you know, you kind of like the content that we make and you stick around or, or whatever. But like when it comes to getting more views, it really has a lot to do with what uh, keywords are are flagged in, by the algorithm in the video that you put you put in, uh, you know, like people try clickbait stuff that gets people to click on it, all this kind of stuff. Um, right now, YouTube is pushing shorts a whole lot. So if you're making lots of shorts, which hopefully we'll be making in the future, uh, then you know you your channel may be promoted to uh, to more people and get more views in that way. Um, that being said, I mean if you're if you're making airsoft content specifically to get views, you should be looking at what type of videos actually get views and trying to make videos like that. And personally, that's not the kind of content that I would make because it, it, it's it's not interesting to me and it's not the kind of gameplay that we make. There's a lot of, you know, sniper content, like you think about guys like, you know, Kicking Mustang and Novrich, love them or hate them. Those are the guys who get, you know, a lot of views, Cheat, cheater compilations, uh, of zoomed in footage of people quote unquote not calling their hits whether or not that's a hit don't really know sort of take it at face value um you know making all these amazing shots at like 80 100 meters or, or, or what have you players not seeing which may or may uh, not the shot actually from, happening <laughs> yeah like all this kind of stuff but you know like those types of videos are the ones that get the most views so if you want to make airsoft content that gets views that's the kind of content that does get the views to come back to the first part of the question, which I think is more more interesting to me as sort of a, a content creator and a video editor, uh, is, um, well, I would say, what do you find interesting, right? Because if you want to make interesting videos, I would say you probably want to make a video that you would find interesting, right? So when I edit videos, for example, um, we know what kind of content we tend to make. We tend to make educational content, talking head content, where we make commentary about a particular topic, whether it's, you know, tips to help you not get hit, whether it's commentating on video from one of our games, like, like, um, like GoPro footage, for instance, uh, or whether it's, you know, foundational, uh, you know, educational content, such as, you know, like, um, this is what suppressive fire is, this is what bounding movement is, and at so some, on. At some point, we and need then, to do just a short that's uh, all clips of me galumphing around awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a couple of ideas that I'm going to float by you later, or you can uh, give me some <laughs> notes. Um, but when it comes to making an interesting video, I mean, the question has to be, like, what is it that you are trying to to convey here, what is the story that you're trying to tell? And for us, in a lot of our videos, I would say the vast majority of videos, our story is what are we trying to educate the viewer about, right? If you're making um, a, a video about your experience at a milsim, what's the story that you're trying to tell? Like, what are the critical elements? Like, you have to treat it almost like you're writing a narrative, like you're writing a story, right? What is the the opening of that story? What does that look like? How do you draw the viewer in to your story? Uh, how do you layer on elements that are interesting on top of that? What are the, so, you know, like, what is the the opening setting? So you're showing up at the, at the Milsim, for example, you're loading your gear, you're making friends, you're given a bit of a sit rep about, okay, what the gameplay is all about. 
Um, and then you start talking about, okay, what did you do? And where did you go? What kind of firefights did you get into? What were the interesting elements, right? What draws and captures the, the, the viewer's attention? And then, you know, what is the climax of the story? And then the, you know, the unra unraveling at the end, right? The denouement, as they say, right? Um, what is the, the debrief? Like, how did everything go? Like, who won? Who lost? What lessons did you learn? What did you enjoy? All this kind of stuff. And then by combining all of those elements, and I would say even like coming up with a, a script or a storyboard or something that tells the story, you can create an interesting video. And then on top of that, you want to layer in your editing elements. Like, do you want quick cuts? Do you want no, like for example, in our, in our videos, if you watch them and pay attention to where they're cut, most of the time you'll notice that there are very few quick cuts uh, because I personally don't like them as an editorial tool. I prefer to not have them. And so instead I, I cover with B-roll and all this kind of stuff. These are all things that as you learn about video editing and you watch other people and you educate yourself, you'll, uh, you'll be able to incorporate and find like, what do you like and what do you dislike? But that being said, you can do all of those things and your video might still not get the views. So I would say, Make sure that you enjoy the process because if you're only doing it to get views, you're probably not going to get that validation, right? Like there are tons of videos that I spend a really long time on working. And I mean like multiple hours, you know, 12 hours, 18 hours, 24 hours of, of work on that gets, you know, a thousand views, 2000 views. Um, does that mean that I'm not going to make those videos? No, because I enjoy making them. If I didn't, and all I was doing it for the views, I would have stopped a long time ago. So I would just consider both of those uh, both of those elements when you're looking at your airsoft video editing. So actually, next question actually is primarily just for Pat. Um, no, do you take any don't. special precautions airsofting if you have a tattoo? Uh, so I don't have any tattoos, so I'm going to pass it off to Pat, who might be able to uh, help a little. Yeah, so I can cover that one off for sure. So if your tattoo is brand new, right, if it's not fully healed, uh, my response is don't play airsoft, right? Uh, if you were going to get a, a tattoo and you're sort of like, okay, well, I've got a two-week healing period, don't go play airsoft during that two-week healing period. Uh, don't do anything that can mess up what you've paid hundreds of dollars for an artist to put on you permanently. <laughs> um you know, if you're if you're absolutely like, oh yeah, I'm going anyway, regardless, uh, you know, you want to make sure you have like hard foam or some sort of padding over it to make sure that it absolutely is not getting hit, right? A bleeder on a healing tattoo will mess that up. Um and your tattoo artist will be angry with you. <laughs> so now that your tattoo is like fully healed, does that change anything about how you play? Like No, so like um, obviously you probably want to avoid, um, bleeders on your tattoos, but, uh, the primary thing there for me is, so if you have a tattoo, part of taking good care of it is trying not to expose it to the sun a huge amount. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so like sunscreen is definitely a given if you're going to have rolled up sleeves and stuff, but realistically, you know, uh, so mine's on my uh, upper arm. I don't roll my shirt up enough that it can get sun when I'm playing yourself, mm -hmm. if I can avoid it, That's just true. because it's, you know, it's not really ideal for it. Um, and that means that there's plenty of, you know, just sort of sleeve over it to prevent it from getting a bleeder. Uh, so I've never had any issues in that regard. Uh, you know, if you're playing airsoft in, you know, like a tank top, uh, then I have other questions for you about your life choices, unless it's just super, super warm where you are. Um, you know, but yeah, the, the key pieces are like, once it's healed, tattoos are pretty durable. Um, you know, I, uh, I do martial arts, uh, I get hit there with swords, you know, like bruising on it doesn't pose me any problems. Uh, so I have really no fear about that. Um, and this is, that's a conversation I did have with, uh, with the tattoo artist when I got it done, you know, but yeah, um, for me, it means that any more tattoos I get will probably be during the off season, which here is six months long. So like I have lots of time, <laughs> yeah, really. um, you know, but if you're going to play with a healing tattoo, definitely like try to put some hard plastic over it, try to put something on top of it that just makes sure it doesn't get hit hard. Or more um, ideally, just, I guess, don't play until it's fully healed. Yeah, well, I mean, really, that is definitely the better advice, you know. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, partly because getting shot there will absolutely suck 
as well. Like you will really not enjoy that experience. Um, you know, in practice, if you have a still healing tattoo, you functionally have an open wound, right? That is how you should be treating it. <laughs> uh, and so would you play airsoft if you had a big cut on your arm? Mm, probably not. No. <laughs> Right. I'm sure you'd have a couple of weirdos who'd be like, yeah, I don't care. But like, come on, sure. Guys. And those people are what I like to call wrong, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, it's, it's a fair question. And until, until I saw it pose, I really, I hadn't considered it, but it's totally right. Like I wondered if, you know, the bruising, but like you said, with swords, it's not an issue. Like once it's fully healed, obviously I'm talking about based on what you just said. Um, yeah. Well, like, yeah, I mean, so, uh, funnily enough, like on a related note, you know, uh, so my ears are pierced. I got that done very late in life relative to, uh, to relative to today. Uh, and, uh, that wasn't fully healed the next time I went to play airsoft. And I literally bought hard shell hearing like radio ear pro to go over it. And it happened that one of my friends was selling some, but I was looking at it. Like I literally took it out of my Amazon cart and bought his instead. Um, oh. Because getting shot in still healing holes in you is going to suck. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, you know, and I mean, they're still useful because getting shot in the ear sucks anyway. Uh, <laughs> like it's not super fun. Let's be real. Um, so, and honestly, you know, the, the hearing amplification stuff is actually useful some of the time too. But uh, practically speaking, yeah, it's the same kind of idea is, you know, like either make sure it's really well protected or just don't play airsoft until it's completely healed. And that's probably true of really any like substantial injury. <laughs> I would definitely agree with that. Having some, having recently popped a rib. I, I, yeah. Uh, actually the next question sort of ties into the, the protection issue as well. Uh, how has your opinion on Facebook changed over the last few months? So this is interesting because for me, I was very much like, Pro face pro for other people, but I don't care for it personally. Like that was my, that's been my take for many, many years. Like I always, I wear like a, a scarf, like a Shima over my face, but I never wore like wire, like mesh face pro or any hard face pro or anything like that. I didn't like uh, the impact that it had on my cheek weld. Um, you know, I wasn't using a riser at the time either. So like, I, it was hard to acquire my dot, like all this kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this. This is stupid. Uh, and I'm not worried about getting shot in the face, because if I get shot in the face, well, I mean, it is what it is. I'm taking that risk, which I stress once again for all of you is terrible advice. And you should definitely not do that. It's what I did knowingly. Um, but I would highly advise against anybody actually listening to me to pass me if we on tell that you, particular yeah, score. If we tell you that we're doing something and also tell you that it's a stupid thing to do, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, that being said, I was gifted a, a set of Delta mic. Uh, so it's a Delta mic uh, face protection, which is, they call it a snood. It's basically just like a, a tube or like a gator that you wear uh, on your on your lower face. It doesn't protect your nose, but it does have a mesh wire that fits over your mouth. And then it's just fabric on the rest of it. And then I wear it all the way up to the back of my, uh, the back of my head. And it covers my ears and my ear pro goes right over it and you don't feel it, all this kind of stuff. And then it protects my neck because uh, it drapes down. In, in terms of protection, I mean here like from the sun and stuff. It doesn't really protect from BBs. It's just cloth, right? But the main thing is it provides you this metal piece that goes over your mouth. And I actually love it. I think it's a great piece of kit. Uh, it doesn't interfere with any of my aiming. It doesn't interfere with any of my equipment. It doesn't interfere with my ability to speak. It's not like super, super comfy, but it's not uncomfortable by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, you've got this metal, this metal grill over your mouth, but it is pushed uh, ahead of your uh, ahead of your face because it has like a padding on the um, on the mesh or whatever. Um, the most uncomfortable part about it is the fact that I have a beard and then the beard sticks in the fabric. But in terms of how it rests on your face and how it feels, it's awesome. And in retrospect, I really I really wish I uh, had sort of bitten the bullet, so to speak, and bought one because it's not that taken a hit or anything like that to my face. But when it comes to going inside one of the buildings, when it comes to being in the village and like being much closer, it provides me a level, an, just an extra level of comfort that I didn't have previously. Um, knowing that if I go inside, there's zero chance 
that I'm going to lose a tooth or something like that as a result of that particular engagement. Now, that being said, I have never been shot in the nose more than since I got this snood because this snood does not protect your nose. I know that there's another one. Um, I think it could be called an Odin or something like that. Uh, I think uh, Ricardo on the Discord, Locks, actually has one, I believe, that actually has the metal piece over your mouth but also extends over your nose. Uh, again, it's a European thing, so it's it's kind of expensive to get into Canada. But the Delta mic is just is really great. Um, but like I said, it doesn't protect your nose, so I've been shot there. I know Chaz modified his goggles; he's got a little piece of foam over his nose bridge to protect it. Uh, you can do you can do a bunch of mods like that. But anyways, to come back to it, I think my opinion of Face Pro has not changed when it comes to other people, uh, but it certainly has changed for me. And I again, like I said, wouldn't consider uh, i would be really hesitant to hit the field without uh, without it the other thing i'll say is that it provides a level of camouflage that didn't exist before now that i have my helmet scrimmed when i put pull my face pro up really the only thing you can see is this little piece of my nose that really helps me blend into the into the background a lot better uh, i know john commented on it like one of the first few games we were playing there have been times where i've been sort of in concealment and people don't see me. So it's a great piece of kit, and I, I'm glad that I have it now. Yeah, speaking sure. as someone who has recently played Find Phil in the Bushes uh, and gotten shot by Phil because he couldn't find him in the bushes, yeah, it helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. My uh, my 10 cents is a little shorter. Uh, I don't have one of those. I've been using my uh, Mashima still. Uh, and talking about it for the podcast a couple of times over the last year has made me much more acutely aware of that. And I think I'm going to pick one up just because I feel like it will decrease my like nervousness about poking my face into places. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, yeah, it's weird to go from it being a thing that I've not cared about for a really long time to being a thing that I'm really conscious of. Um, yeah. and you know, almost certainly to the good, in the sense that it's going to cause me to go do the smart thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when you look at it retrospectively, like it was so stupid of us to do that because back in, you know, back in like the 2009, 2010, 2011, when we were playing at Redcliffe all the time, we didn't even chrono back then. So we had guys shooting probably much hotter than realistically they should have. So, and myself included, to be honest, because I mean, the only test we would do is, are you comfortable getting shot with your own gun point blank range? Uh, and if you remember, like I shot, you shot my scar in my back the first time that we had it upgraded and it bled immediately. And I was still like, yeah, that's fine. Well, we weren't wearing face pro at that time. Like that was not great. So especially you know, when you we consider that like, I didn't foolish. have dental insurance. Then. <laughs> like, yeah. Ooh, past Pat was not bright. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so I would say opinion of face pro, like I said, has changed. Um, for others, not at all. You should definitely be wearing it. For me, absolutely. <laughs> you should definitely be wearing it. The update is, we should also definitely be wearing it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next question. Um, what happened to Pat's World War II impression kit? Uh, before Pat answers, I'm going to answer, and that is HPA. That is that is the answer. <laughs> all of Pat's money, time, effort, uh, waking hours have gone from whatever other hobbies he had. It's all HPA all the time now. He isn't wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will, I'll, I'll preface this with, I don't want to HPA the grand. The idea of doing that is offensive to me. Um, because well, that's, it, you know, small victories, I suppose. Yeah, right. Take what you can get. Uh, it ruins yeah. the, the verisimilitude of the thing. Uh, so the answer is I'm nowhere closer uh, to getting to game it than I was because uh, instead of buying the boots for my World War II impression, I have focused on uh, sort of organizing and sorting out my HPA stuff more. Uh I don't definitely don't regret that decision. Uh, I uh, I'm having a lot of fun playing around with it, uh, but it does mean that the boots are probably not going to happen until next season at this rate, uh, because uh, I'm doing daft HPA things. <laughs> um, for the moment, I've, I've been talked out of HPAing another gun, uh, the LMG, so I'm I'm holding off on that uh, until maybe next year as well. Uh, Unless I randomly come into money, which seems very unlikely. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it is it is that just, uh, I need $400 boots to complete the uh, impression. Uh, they're not $400 if you live in America, but you know, I don't. Uh, and so they've been sort of put on the back burner. Um, was this question from John? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I can't um, say. 
but yeah, I still really love the love the impression, really love the kit. Uh, it's super fun to uh, to play around with. Uh, I just have not worn it to a game yet because I still haven't bought the boots. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty terrible. I should I should definitely do that. But the uh, the things that I've done with my HPA setups are really really fun. Uh, and uh, I'm just sort of chortling at that lunacy at the moment. So uh, <laughs> yeah, gun's not going to HPA itself, guys. Come on. I'm pretty much you know it's, it turns out that polar, putting Polar Star engines into things isn't cheap. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Thanks for that question, John. I'm sorry. Um, so last question that we have, this is a bit more of a serious question. What is the line between like a fair amount of protection on a player? So protection from BBs and so on and patting yourself so much that you're not going to feel hits. Should there be rules at fields about what people can, can wear for personal protection? Um, I'm going to start off by saying, I don't think here we're talking about stuff like like riot shields or police shields or like whatever. Like I think here we're talking about, or the, the person that's this question is, is really talking about like what I would classify as PPE, personal protective equipment. So helmets, knee pads, like all this kind of stuff. Um, because I think riot shields are kind of stupid, but that's my opinion. I'm, that doesn't, I'm putting my brand on it, but like, it's, it's just kind of like, eh, why? And we have, we had some bad experiences as well. So that might be, uh, yeah, I mean, might be tainting my, my memory. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my experience with, uh, riot shields has been that, um, either they're being used by like little kids who want to play airsoft and don't want to get hit. And I have a lot more patience for that because I have a lot more patience for a 12 year old or a 10 year old yeah. who's playing. Like we had a kid who was like probably 10, who was playing with his dad. You know, they basically just always operated as a buddy peer and the kid invariably was like shooting you uh, with a pistol or something from behind a riot shield. And that was fine because he was eight or 10 and or 12 and having fun and hanging out with his dad. And that matters yeah, exactly. more than Ear, ear quotes gameplay balance you know but like yeah. i've also played with guys who are like you know single handing an smg behind one who are my age and i don't really feel that that's in the spirit of the rules of yourself but that's also not the point of this question <laughs> yeah it's funny because like i remember having conversations with uh shane from ireland shane um on the discord uh, and he was very like adamant that he felt like plate carriers were uh unnecessary for airsoft and they should not be allowed because players who wear a plate carrier intrinsically will not feel the majority of the hits that are coming to them because i mean you know you get hit in the chest right that's why people wear armor in the chest because that's where the largest center of mass is right <laughs> so as a consequence of that though like you're wearing a, a, a plate carrier you're wearing additional protection in a place where you're likely to be hit and not feel it and therefore that makes you more likely to ignore your hits either on by accident mostly uh but also on purpose right because if it doesn't hit you have really if it doesn't hurt excuse me you have very little incentive to not take that hit right so that's sort of the mentality i think behind this question and there's a lot of players who wear who wear um play carriers right the vast majority i would say of aerosofters especially who start getting into it get some sort of like you know static m4 type vest deal uh, or cross draw, whatever, and or uh, some sort of plate carrier like um, 1694 or JPC or Cyraz replica or, or I mean, whatever, they're right? they're widely available. Uh, they look cool. You've seen them in the video games that are, frankly, if you're playing your soft games, you probably played and enjoyed. There you yeah. go. Um, so and to be honest, like I've worn a plate carrier specifically for years because I didn't want to get hit in chest as much. Like I, I appreciated. Well, I, I wore training plates too, but like I, I appreciated the added level of protection that it gave me. Man, getting shot in the um, hips ain't fun. Like, <laughs> yeah, totally. And I mean, I've been re-experiencing that wearing a chest rig, but I would, I would never go back at this point. But like, that's that's certainly part of it. And then uh, layer on top of that, like you got. I'm not talking about like juggernaut players like if you're using that gameplay mechanic of a juggernaut or whatever but you can still wear all that armor you got guys who are showing up who've got like a cyraz but they've also got the shoulder protection right like the deltoid protection or whatever and then the neck protection and then they've got the groin protector and maybe they have the thigh protectors as well and the side plates and all this kind of stuff you could wear all of that right and that's not for my in my view that's not problematic like it's not cheating obviously but the question does ask itself like is that too much and does that detract to gameplay so i think the question um 
I'll ask you and then I'll answer it myself is so when you ran a Cyrez, like, did you find it impacted your ability to tell when you'd gotten hit? Not consciously. Yeah. Like, I mean, for my, uh, you know, my 10 cents, like when I was running the Cyrez, um, the 6094 didn't really ever fit me well enough to say that, oh yeah, it was taking hits on me. Like I'm a big dude. It's a small plate carrier, whatever. But like the Cyrez, you know, covered my entire torso very much. Uh, but getting a BB hitting that big, you know, gigantic roll <laughs> of fabric, uh, it makes a very audible specific sound. And I did not have any trouble going, oh yeah, that's definitely the noise that means I've been hit. That's true. But I made the same point to Shane. And what he said was, you also wouldn't know if you had taken a hit and not felt it and not heard it, you would have no way of knowing. Totally. Um, so that's what I meant when you said like, have has it impacted your ability and i said not consciously because i agree like there's lots of times i mean my my uh training plates uh inside the the jpc like they're steel covered with a thin layer of foam so that it's not this uh, uncomfortable or whatever it makes a, a, a noise right and you can you know you can feel it obviously like if someone tapping on your chest with bbs but you can very very much hear it and if it hits your mags or whatever you can hear it as well right so i don't think that's that's an issue but I, I the agree. question like, does ask itself like did you ignore hits unknowingly because you were protected? And if you hadn't been, um, it might have hurt and you might have known, right? So I'm comfortable saying, no, I don't think I did. I don't think that was an issue. Um, now, part of that is like where we were playing at the time. Um, the nature of the gameplay at the time was I'm going to say kind of slow paced in a lot of cases. Like we were playing at Redcliffe. It was a lot more creep around and like actively use cover and stealth to your advantage than it was like run and gun um but also i as a mindset thing tend to err on the side of calling myself out right if i think i got hit and i'm not sure i tend to just go okay you know you know fine i'll call that out and we'll go back yeah. next game and um that's not a like you should do what i do uh this is my mentality thing it's just how i have always approached this is if i'm not sure if i got hit but think I did, I'm going to call myself out. Um, yeah. So really, like the only situation there where I'm like going to get hit on my Syrahs when I was running it and not feel it or hear it is if I'm running. And so like, yeah, okay, if you if I'm running uh, and you land exactly one BB or two BBs on my Syrahs and I don't get called out, like I don't feel them, I don't hear them, I don't observe it, and I somehow get into cover and don't get hit again, my bad, <laughs> right? Like that mm -hmm. definitely is a thing that could happen. I, I'll, I'll completely agree. Um, I, however, have been shot at by enough airsoft players to know that if that's happening and there are no hits on my face, neck, arms, or legs during the, the burst, then I've been hit by someone who's really accurate, <laughs> you know, improbably mm -hmm. accurate, I will say. And that's not to yeah. sort of like, you know, poo-poo the idea. I definitely, you know, am willing to exceed that it's possible that during the like six years I ran that thing, I got hit on the Cyrez and erroneously kept playing. Um, but I think it's very easy, especially if you watch the kind of videos that Phil was talking about earlier that get made a lot of like, oh, look at all these cheaters um, to go, oh man, like I'm going to default my assumption that the other guys I'm playing with aren't honorable. Uh, and I think that's not how I want to play Airsoft. And like, it's, it's a choice. It's a mindset approach to playing, right? So if I think I've been hit or if I'm unsure, yeah, okay, I'll call myself out. It's airsoft. I'll be playing in five minutes. Uh, if I'm shooting at a guy and, you know, I mean, at this point I've got a 4X magnified scope. So if I'm shooting someone and they're not calling their hits, I'm usually pretty sure of it. <laughs> um, but if I'm shooting at someone and they're not calling their hits and I can't like visibly see it hitting them through the optic, assume you missed, right? These are not yeah. the most accurate things in the world. <laughs> um, just, yeah, this is a sport where, you know, playing honorably is the point, right? If you're not playing honorably, you're doing it wrong uh, in a palpable, practical way. So just assume that the people you're playing with, unless you're extremely sure otherwise, are, are being honorable. Um, you'll get angry while you're playing less. You'll have more fun. <laughs> But I think, you know, on the flip side, like without going down the the honorable versus dishonorable players, because I'm, I'm sure like 
you don't need to be wearing all this extra PPE to uh, not call your hits. That's a thing that we see all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, not as frequently as we used to, but certainly, I mean, it's, it's a fact of airsoft, right? Someone's wearing a chest rig and you shot him and he just ignores it or whatever. Uh, or, you know, you like it happened to me uh, earlier this season when I was running from cover to cover and Matt shot at me and he hit me, but because of the adrenaline or whatever, I did not feel it, right? I just kept running. And it's not until we got to the safe zone that he pointed out that he had hit me. And I was like, really? And I checked and yeah, lo and behold, there's a little welt where he said that there was. And I was like, wow, I did not feel that at all. At the time, so obviously PPE in this particular case, like extra padding and stuff, really doesn't doesn't have a factor. But the question does ask itself around: so if people are doing this to protect themselves, which is fair, are they inadvertently? I guess not. I'm not saying dishonorably, but are they inadvertently giving themselves an advantage by providing themselves more more protection from BBs that they may not feel and therefore continue playing in a situation where they, they they should have been out? And I don't necessarily know that the answer to that question is very clear cut. I think it's it's probably very situational for one thing because you may wear that equipment and never get hit there for one thing, right? I'm the other thing is I would hate for players to feel like they are not allowed to wear the type of protective equipment that makes them feel safe playing the sport, right? So, so you could say that wearing a mesh face mask is, you know, oh, well, you might get hit in the face mask and not feel it, although I would say you probably will feel it. But I mean, <laughs> I imagine you, you know, ostensibly it's possible. Or uh, to use an, uh, probably a more appropriate uh, example, a knee pad. You could get hit in a, in a hard knee pad and not feel it. So should you not be allowed to wear knee pads if they help you make if they may help make you feel more safe on the field, for instance? Like obviously not, right? And so I think finding that like that that mm, to to say it another way. I don't think players should feel like they can't wear certain things if they feel that that level of protection is important to them, if the reason that they're wearing it is for protection, right? I used to wear elbow pads my first couple of games that I played Airsoft like ever, and I quickly ditched them because I didn't feel that they were very helpful for the kinds of play that we do here. Um, but I didn't wear them because they would protect my elbows from getting hit or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And I would have hate, hated to be told, hey, you can't wear those because it's too much. Yeah, right? so I think that it's definitely... You know, I don't think fields should be making, you know, rules limiting this sort of gear personally. Um, and I think one of the key pieces that I'd, I'd add to that is, so, you know, you're saying for argument's sake, right, if you start like upping, you know, the amount of protection on your Syrahs, right, you're, you're doing the deltoid protectors, you're doing the thigh protectors, you're doing the big collar. So I've run the Syrahs. Uh, I thought about buying the deltoid protectors uh, at a couple of points because I thought they looked cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, having run this art, running a big chest rig with a big pile of stuff slows you down. It makes you mm -hmm. louder. It makes you bulkier. It makes it harder to go prone. It makes it harder to take effective use of cover. So like, frankly, if it does work out to being occasionally slightly advantageous in a like, oh, they didn't feel their hit and they didn't call it kind of way, um, just because like where it's not anyone being shitty and it's just, uh, you know, like stuff happens, you're moving around, you don't notice hits. At the end of the day, shrug, move on. Like it, I don't think it's going to be a big enough thing. And also I think that the drawbacks to wearing that much gear uh, are probably going to air quotes, balance that out across a body of gameplay. Um, yeah, I tend to agree with you. And, you know, the other thing, too, and I think it's worth mentioning, is that depending on where you are, obviously, but I think I can speak for us here in, in St. John's, Newfoundland, for sure, is that over the years, since we've started chronoing, we've been pushing and pushing and pushing that limit, right? So now we have a lot more players who are showing up to the field with AEGs shooting close to 1.6 joules, which is our AEG limit, than we did, let's say, four years ago, right? And... Unless you live in a place like in the United Kingdom where, you know, certain of the limits are, are much lower or what have you, or in Ireland, I think, where the chain is from, where the limits are lower. When you're looking at increasing limits, I think it's reasonable for people to want to protect themselves more. Like face pro is a great example of that. Like now you have scar scarcely have people showing up without face pro because, you know, guns are more powerful than they used to be. And so consequently, 
I think it's natural for people to want to protect themselves from that pain more because we're not here to get hurt. We're here to get hit, but we're not here to get hurt. And so I think in in that respect, it makes a lot of sense for players to to want to wear additional protection. Plus, to your point earlier, like it just looks cool, like you're doing the impression kit or you want to relive your Call of Duty, you know, um, memories or whatever. That's all fine. But if there's a hit calling issue, then that needs to be addressed with the individual. I think that blanket putting a rule in place, especially at a field, blanket putting a rule in place to say, okay, well, none of you are allowed to do this anymore because of this one guy is more is more problematic. And we see that in our society when it comes to laws like, like speed limits, for example, right? You're like, you see a speed limit in one area and it's like 40 kph. And you're like, why is the speed limit so slow here? Well, it's because there's one asshole who did something stupid and the city puts a, put a uh, you know speed limit in place. But most people are being reasonable about it. And I think that's a, you know, a similar approach that we should avoid taking in Airsoft, which is putting this blanket rule in place just because you've had this problem with this one individual. If you're playing at a field and the guy's showing up and he's wearing a full juggernaut suit and he's repeatedly not calling his hits, that's something you should deal with it, you know, then and there rather than saying, hey, all you newbies, you can't wear knee pads I, because I it's... Mean- Frankly, you know. in much the same way that the guy rocking an SMG in a riot shield was a person we had to talk to about that, right? Yeah. Um, if there's a problem, yeah. it's usually going to be an individual player, not a huge, broad issue. Um, you know, the other thing that I think is is useful here is so, like, if you're seeing a guy rocking, you know, the the heavier PP and they want more protection, you know, feels right. You know, when I started playing Airsoft, uh, our guns were the hottest guns on the field and they shot 375. FPS with point twos, right? Which is way under the current field limit everywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, at the time they were considered to be quite, you know, quite zippy. Um, I've definitely been shot the last couple of games I played by guys who were absolutely like at the margin for uh, what yeah, like we allow. Yeah, one five eight, one five seven. Yeah, whatever, for what yeah. we allow on a uh, on a sort of rifleman kit and. You know, I I still don't care. <laughs> like, you yeah. Know, but um, I uh, I definitely remember getting shot by a guy and going, man, like after the game, I was like, man, there's some zip to that. Like you're shooting pretty hot. And he's like, yeah, I'm pretty much like dead on the line. I'm like, oh, yeah, good enough. You know, I'm not bothered. But like, yeah, I definitely noticed that his gun hit harder than Phil's. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. So, you know, what can you do? Well, what you can do is wear more protection. And if that's sure, if that helps you, if that helps you have a better day of airsoft, then I think more power to you. Am I necessarily going to do that? Not really. Uh, for the, you know, like we said before, like, like you were saying that wearing more protection means it's, it's more kit, it's hotter, it's harder to carry around the field, all this kind of stuff. So it's not really for me. Like I'm still going to wear my knee pads and my helmet. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going back to a plate carrier and I'm certainly not going down the road of like groin protector and deltoid protectors and like all that stuff. But like, you know, if, if you're a player who's doing that, yeah, do it. Don't, don't feel bad about it. I think, um, you know, especially because, you know, I mean, from a, from a practical gameplay point of view, like we really do tend to preach like aggressive play and sort of, you know, violence of action, uh, as mechanically effective tools to win an airsoft game. So if you can't push yourself to be aggressive because you feel like you're going to get hurt, toss on some more PPE, give it a try. All right. Well, that's it for the questions this week. Um, keep them coming. We always love doing Q&A. It's, uh, I mean, like I said, it was a, a mixed bag today, but it's always fun to uh, to answer some questions that we see from you guys on the Discord or on the YouTube uh, comment section. So feel free to keep them coming. Um, Plus, Phil gets to see me look confused. <laughs> well, that's true, yeah, because I don't share the questions with Pat ahead of time. So there you go. But guys, uh, that's it for us this week. That's all we've got for you. Uh, tune in next week. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Have a great week. Play some Airsoft.